You are tuned to the Nighttime Podcast, focused on the fringe of Canada. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to a planned two-part series covering the police-involved shooting death of then 17-year-old Riley Fairholm. In our prior episode, we were joined by Riley's mom, Tracy Wing, who told us about her son, his death, and her mission to hold the police accountable for what she and her many supporters believe was the unnecessary shooting of her 17-year-old son. Tonight, we'll continue to explore Riley's story, but we're going to shift our focus to another one of the heartbroken loved ones Riley left behind. Our guest, Camille LaRoche, met Riley by chance on a notoriously bad app. Then, a week later, they were a couple. The relationship would extend across the majority of Riley's last years of life, and during it, Camille would experience many of Riley's ups and downs. And she's about to tell us all about her time with him. So let's get into it. Tonight, in this episode of Nighttime, we'll be joined by Camille LaRoche, and our topic is the death of Riley Fairholm. Fifteen months after their son was shot in the head by police, Riley Fairholm's parents are still outraged. The night he was killed, Riley called 911 and was waving a pellet gun when six police officers arrived. His parents were surprised to hear that it took only one minute from the time police arrived on the scene to the moment their son was shot once from a distance of about a hundred feet. They wish officers had taken more time to try to talk him down. The decision was a poor decision by one officer. I would expect if there was that much of an emergency to fire, there would have been more than one bullet fired. So just to start, Camille, maybe just give me an introduction of who you are, where you are, and maybe tell me a bit about your life. Um, Well, I'm from Waterloo, but I've uh, I've studied in Saguenay in the um, radio hosting, um, cool. but yeah, I studied three years in Saguenay and I came back when COVID started and I moved to Sherbrooke where I don't know what I really want to do with my life right now. So yeah, I, I want to travel and I, I don't know, I listen to a lot of music, but overall I'm I'm kind of lost in what I want to do in life. So yeah, (laughs) that's a good place to be. I I miss being lost and trying to figure out what I want to do in life. (laughs) I have a cat (laughs) and yeah, that's pretty much it. I don't do really much. I work and I watch movies and listen to music and I hang out with friends. (laughs) That's pretty much it. (laughs) Well, let's, let's get into how you met Riley. And it's obvious that you and Riley had a very special connection in after talking to Riley's mom, Tracy, she she told me the same thing. So let, let's start with, how did, how did you meet Riley? Tell me about how you got to know each other. Oh my God, we met in the weirdest way, actually, because I don't know if you know the app, uh, Ask.fm. Yeah. It's the worst app that ever has existed. Yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, you ask questions, anon- anonymous, anon- anonymous ask- <laughs> anonymously, you'll ask a question and then random people can answer. Yeah, exactly. And I think like, I think I ran into him on that app and like, we just um, moved to uh, to Facebook to talk and stuff. And it was, it went really fast actually, because we were just talking and um, one day we just decided to meet. And um, I think like, I think it maybe took maybe a week and I think we were all already together. It was just weird. I don't know, you add someone on Facebook and you just start talking and yeah. boom, a week later, you just start dating. <laughs> so it was that kind of. <laughs> so it happened It happened fast. But what, what do you think it was that attracted you to each other? Like, was there something about him and you where you're like, yeah, we're a match. Let's let's get together. Well, I just thought he was really cute. He, he had beautiful eyes, a beautiful smile. It was just funny. Um, I don't know. And at first, uh, he said like he that he could uh, speak French and everything. And at first that I just, when he first started uh, speaking in French, I was like, oh no, it's okay. I can practice my English anyway. <laughs> I thought it was, it was so cute. So it really didn't bother me at all. Um, 
but he was just really kind and he was just so sweet and he loved like my dogs and um, he was really nice with my parents and my family. Uh, like he was really um, trying to speak in French with my family too. So like my family really liked him too. Yeah, so, and, and just yeah. so people get it is Riley was English primarily and knew a little bit of French. You are French primarily and your, your English is good. Uh, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, because Riley, his mom's French, but his dad's... Uh, speak English and I what I've heard I think that at first um, they tried to like speak uh, to him in English and in French but when they got uh, Regan his little sister I think it, it just became too hard and they just said oh never mind we're just gonna speak in English yeah, <laughs> so yeah and when, when you and Riley were, were dating tell me a little bit about like your relationship what did you do how did you spend time like what was it like for you two since we were like 17, uh, we didn't have cars and <laughs> anything. So when we saw each other, uh, we mostly went just walking, talking. And I I had a, well, I still have, but I had a, my camera and I always like took pictures of him. And uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. the, the photos you took of him though, you, they're, they're good photos. Are you an, into photography or something? Um, well, I used to be a lot more than I am now. I don't know. I'm just not really doing it, yeah. but <laughs> but yeah, uh, I really liked it. And well, Riley was the kind of of guy that just didn't mind being taken in pic taken in pictures. Like I think he actually liked it. <laughs> <laughs> when I stumbled upon them, I assumed he had a friend that was a photographer or something. Yeah, no, it was just me. <laughs> <laughs> it was just me. <laughs> I don't know, but he, he took pictures of me too. So <laughs> yeah, let's get into like people who know Riley's story who've read about him or, or listened to his mother speak they know that he sh the, that he had struggled with depression off and on throughout his life during your time being close with Riley did, did you see that side of him like how did that come to the surface when you when you knew him um well at first in a relationship I could not tell and no, no. really not it didn't seem like he had any uh, trouble uh, dealing with mental health or anything. Mm -hmm. Like he was always so funny, making jokes. He was, I think when I speak about Riley, I often um, refer him as a child. I, I don't know if you can see what I mean. It's just like, he was always just so joyful and always smiling and just always uh, dancing and just singing. And he was just, he seemed like he was happy all the time. Mm -hmm. that's a lot what attracted me to him too I don't mm -hmm. know I, I thought he was just so cute and <laughs> so um but yeah really at first not at all um but when but later 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 yeah mm -hmm. like I I saw him change I saw him change a lot was uh, like as far as him changing was there so like a kind of a turning point where you know Riley just didn't seem the same like is there any kind of point where you you can point to and be like you know Riley it's it's he seemed to kind of struggle a bit after this yeah well I, uh when I left for CJEP in Saguenay mm -hmm. well now uh, at this time we were uh doing long distance because it's, it's like five hours oh from, really? uh, from it, what why did you leave where you were going to school away was that why you left yeah yeah I was going to school in the program I was in um was only uh, being um taken in uh in Saguenay and how, how did you and Riley do the the long distance thing are you just on the phone all the time or um, well it didn't last long actually uh we broke up not too long after uh, I left okay um and I don't know at that time I I feel like it's that point when I think about it I feel like he started being really different um he like I, I feel like he was mad <laughs> he was mad at me uh, for for things so I don't know and he was just saying that he started uh, taking drugs and stuff and I really oh. didn't know what to tell him I like I didn't know what to do and I I feel like I mean at 17 I I, I felt like okay you 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 try you're trying this into uh, mm. and stuff but I didn't know if he was serious because he was mad at me and um, it felt like he was um, trying to uh, make me feel guilty or things oh. like that. Uh, gu guilty for leaving or was there other stuff you had going on that caused you to have fights? Well, mostly for leaving and 
well, it's a long story, but um, when I left, it, it, it just was weird from the first day. I felt like we weren't talking a lot and I don't know. And um, I mean, I, I feel bad about it, but um, there were, in my program, there's a lot of um, parties and stuff with all their integrations, activities. I, stuff. I get it. You're, you're 17. I was, I was there. <laughs> Yeah. But I mean, it, it, nothing really happened. Like I, I, a guy kissed me and I told him right away, but I felt so bad. Okay. But yeah, and he was mad about, uh, he was mad at me for that. I, I feel like he was more mad at me for leaving him than actually <laughs> kissing the guy. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get it. You'll have a hard time finding a 17 year old couple that didn't have these kind of issues. And so, so this is uh, not weird uh, at, at all. But okay. regardless, y you went and your life was continuing as a 17 year old yeah. would. And it was a, a lot of parties and like for two weeks straight every day. Well, it was intense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in the long well both the long distance relationship and just you being in a different scenario is is that ultimately what led to you and riley ending your relationship yeah well i i just felt so guilty and i felt bad and i i felt like i could never forgive myself for what i've done and uh uh so that's why i left him but after that he was mad at me and i don't know when he was talking to me um I felt like, yeah, he was trying to make me feel guilty and he told me he was at parties and uh, doing drugs and I don't know, he, he felt weird because he never, he, he's never been like that before that. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't really know what to say and uh, I felt really bad, really, really bad. I, I remember I kept telling him I was sorry and like, it, and it wasn't text. So I felt like maybe he didn't really feel what I was really feeling, so. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, but I really wanted to talk to him, so I could ex so we could just explain things and talk. And I and we saw each other again um, uh, by the by Christmas time, I think. Um, so mm -hmm. so yeah, and um, when we saw each other, it actually went really well, and I was scared. <laughs> and then we started talking again, and we came back together. <laughs> Oh really? Okay. So did you did you like move home or move to where he was, and or were you gonna deciding to get back together during Christmas break and try to try it again long distance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That we was uh, we I was about to leave again for Stagnate, oh but uh, we we just decided to try it, to try it again. But this is when it started to be really bad. <laughs> oh, okay. So after after Christmas break, you're you're back together and you go back to school. Yeah. How did things change then? Well, I I really don't know what, and it was, it was okay. But I felt like not not that he had trust issues, but like it became a really toxic relationship. I mm. and it was just really bad. And at that time too, my parents were separating too, and it oh. was really hard. I don't know, just things like that. He would, uh, we would split up and um, go back, uh, go back together. But like, I, at first when it, with that, when that happened, like I loved him a lot. So I would come back to him too, but at some point it was really hard for me with my parents and everything I was dealing with too. Mm, yeah. But, but when, but then he started to really talk to me about, um, the fact that he wasn't doing well, that like uh, at school it was bad. His his teachers were just not not nice with him, or I don't know, they weren't fair. Mm -hmm. uh, so one day he he told me that uh, he went to his uncle's house, and um, and um, when uh, he was at it at his uncle's, he found I I I, I wait wait a second, I'll just. Because I found uh, a screenshot of that message that he sent oh. me, so I'll just uh, read it. Yeah, you. while you're finding it, this was a message you would have been at school that he sent you. Like this is still during the school year. Yeah, I yeah yeah it was during the school year, and he was just, he he told me um, I started doing pills and I would have nightmares every night and and it became uh, too much one day. So I took my uncle's three four seven three hundred. Uh, I think yeah, it's like. A gun, yeah. 
uh, when I went to visit and went into the bathroom and stared at the mirror wondering if I could and I broke down. So he told me that. Wow. I did, I really didn't know what to say to him. I was I would just feel feel really bad and I remember I I told him that like he was he wasn't feeling good right now but I I was like there's something that's going to happen soon to you and I was like there's something good that will happen you'll find what you want to do in life because he kept telling me that he didn't know what, what he what, where he was going um what he wanted to do with his life um, that he didn't see himself live past 30 and stuff like that so yeah so so this message the one you just read to me that would be a very shocking message to receive from your boyfriend or, for, or from anyone for that matter did you like was there ever a point where you thought like this is as bad as it sounds like did it seem like it was as bad as it sounds now in hindsight oh well yeah i was really scared and since i was far away i really didn't know what to do or to tell him was the, what happens next like is there were you st when you finished school i'm assuming in like june did you go back to where he was did you reunite at the beginning of the summer Okay, well, um, what happened uh, was that um, at that time we were still together and it was so hard because he was leaving me and then coming back and then leaving me and then coming back. And one time I felt like overwhelmed and I was myself in a depression with my family and stuff and I felt like he needed me. So when he, w he would come back, like even if I really loved him, I, I I really felt really bad at that time, and I felt like we need to uh, we needed to um, to I need we needed a break, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, just to me think about stuff that ha happens in my life and him with his, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, so uh, we uh, let, we broke up. Um, so this is the real breakup. <laughs> okay. And when when was this real breakup? When was when was this uh, roughly? I think it was the end of April. Okay. So you would this would have happened when you were still in school and Yeah, yeah, I was still in I was still in school and um that week I someone in my family died and I oh. came back uh, like for a week. So this is when I wanted to talk to him, but before I could talk to him face to face, he said like, oh no, um, I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe he didn't want to see me or I don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, then like, I, I, I didn't have, a, I didn't talk to him for a while after that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he had another girlfriend. Um, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. I think a, a week or two before before it happened, I texted him and I said that I was ready uh, and I was coming back uh, and that I was ready to uh, to give him back his, his stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, okay. And then next thing I know, this happened. Wow, so you never had a chance <laughs> to give him his stuff back? No, I still have his stuff. Um, how did, like, and you say, and then this happened, how did you, learn what had happened to Riley. How, do you remember how you found out? Uh, one morning, well, the, uh, on the, the 25th, I woke up and uh, I was uh, going through Instagram and I saw that picture, that photo he posted. It was black and I, I don't re re remember like words, what he said, but I remember it, it was something like, oh, I'm so happy knowing that uh, soon people I will be better or I don't know, something like that. And when I saw that, I was like, I texted him. I texted his mom and I texted my friends. I was like, there's something wrong. I think, I think there's something wrong with, with Riley. And so this, this is this for right now. And I'm just kind of like stressing out and stuff. I'm just going through um, Instagram, talking to my friends and, um, my parents this day, I don't know, I don't know how, but both of them were at the house this, that, that day. And uh, they were watching the news and, and I heard like a, um, uh, a man got uh, killed by police in like the home. And 
I was like, hmm, there's a picture and now the news. So I, I got up and I went into uh, the living room where my parents were. And when I saw that, I just start, started crying and they were like, what's up, what's going on? And I, and I just said, I, I think it's Riley. I'm not sure, but I think it's Riley. <laughs> and they were like, no, no, no way. And I just um, showed them the, the photo. They, they they were they they told me that no it's impossible it's not him and uh, i went back in my room and i was just always waiting for um uh, for other news to come and uh, every i think every 15 minutes 15 minutes or something like that um there was uh, something new and the first thing was oh it wasn't like a man oh, okay so just then i was like mm. And then, oh, uh, it happened at that street. Mm, he lived. He lived not far from there. So yeah, things like that. And I just knew, but I didn't have the confirmation uh, yet. And um, I think like maybe an hour later, I received a message, and it was a journalist, and she told me, "Hi, I think you knew the guy, like the the guy who got killed by police." Oh. Yeah in the Rome Lake. Yeah. So this this was my confirmation, a journalist. <laughs> oh my goodness. That wanted to talk to me. Yeah, like um when when he had posted the photo to Instagram that initially made you concerned about him, like on Instagram people can add comments to photos. So I'm thinking when that happened, you were probably going through to see what people were saying. Like because Riley's other friends I'm sure were writing stuff. Like what were what were people were you the only one that seemed really concerned or was all of his friends panicking, do you think, at this point? Um, I, I remember scrolling through uh, this the picture that he, he posted and really, like, nothing was really happening. Um, mm. But um, I kept scrolling on Facebook, uh, all the art articles and stuff like that. Mm. And um, I saw comments about random people just saying, oh, oh, yeah one less killer well okay. I don't know. They were it, just like, people probably saw a news article and assuming that the police you know stopped a crime and yeah well since there weren't any a lot of informations they just mm -hmm. believed that police killed killed him because he was dangerous and stuff but he weren't and mm -hmm. and yeah so i was really bothered by this comment in particular mm -hmm. so um when uh, the journalist texted me on Facebook to um, um, to have an interview with me, I said yes, because <laughs> I really wanted to show what what he really was. Mm -hmm. And he was not a killer. So and now like this, we're talking now a couple of years after it happened, and a lot more is known about what actually happened that morning. What are your what are your thoughts on how the police handled this within, you know, within 61 seconds of arrival? To, to shoot him, like, how do you feel about that? Or, how, or what are your thoughts on that? Um, I feel like it, were, it went really fast. I just can't believe that by the time they um, stopped him and the time they shot him, I, I don't understand why it took 61 seconds. They had time to talk to him, to try to help him to i don't know i just feel like something something's clearly missing from that intervention and now for like so many people who know riley's story they know it in the context of the way his life ended and his mother's quest for justice and accountability for the rcmp and i think when people spend a lot of time in that side of the story they kind of miss who Riley is and was and what type of person he was. For people who don't know Riley outside of his story, like how how should people remember him and how do you remember him without thinking about, you know, the way his life ended? Um, Riley should be remembered as a funny, kind, and just really nice and gentle man. So, I, well, he felt like he was happy, but I don't know, but it, it was unnoticeable.
You, you couldn't tell. It may seem like we're at the end, but I got something else to end this episode with. Something often happens after a discussion's over. Oftentimes, the microphone is no longer recording and the moment's lost. Other times, I get lucky and I forget to stop the recording. But tonight, something altogether different happened. Not long after getting off the call with Camille, I received a voice memo from her which shared some of her thoughts that were even more personal than what came out in her interview. It was truly moving stuff. Although this message was intended to be between her and I, she agreed to allow me to share it with all of you. So here is what Camille wanted to say, but didn't get a chance to. Um, before our call, um, uh, you sent me questions that uh, you were uh, thinking of asking me. And uh, the last one, I read it again after our, our chat. And um, I thought about it a little and I just feel like I need to say um, that what we should learn from Riley's story is that mental health is so important and we never know when people, um, when someone is not well. Some people can hide it really, really, really good. And after what happened to Riley, I... I saw my I saw myself uh, feeling more aware of people, uh, people's feelings and emotions, and I just always want people to to feel great and be happy, and I don't want this to happen again. Let's just tell people that we love them and that they matter to us and they're important. And I I feel also like I should have talked about. A sign that I had because I've been lo looking everywhere for one um, for the past three years and I don't know if it fits in the, uh, the subject of our conversation but I feel like when someone dies it's normal to like be waiting for a sign or something I don't know but it also gives us hope and helps us feel so much better and my sign was a dream and my dream was that I was at my grandma's house and it just knocked on the door and I said ah, I'm gonna take it I'm going to open the door and when I opened the door there was Riley like if he was coming back from a long trip that we all thought he was dead and that he came back and I remembered that hug that long and um, full of emotions and well it was a, a long and big hug and I remember him telling me that everything was okay and everything was good that he was happy and everything will be all right <laughs> and then I woke up <laughs> and I felt so much better and I feel like it's the first real sign of grief that I think I felt in a way that I don't know I feel less guilty I think I it just felt good to see him again one last time um, since we didn't have a proper goodbye so. Camille's memories of and experiences with Riley should serve as a wake-up call or at least a reminder to everyone out there. If you have a friend or an acquaintance that seems to be suffering, find a way to connect with them and let them know that you care. It's not obvious what someone is dealing with, but the battles aren't always easy and they're not always a fair fight. And with that, I'll end this episode of Nighttime, but before we part, I have some thanks. First, a big thank you to Camille for sharing her story with me and with the listeners of Nighttime. Next, a thank you to Monty Data for contributing this show's musical theme. It's a piece called Noir Tokyo. And lastly, a massive thank you to everyone who listens to Nighttime, as without your interest and your support, this show would be as pointless as it would be impossible. 
But with that said, keeping the show alive is and has always been an uphill battle. So if you want to help take a bit of weight off the show's back, please listen on the premium feed. And not only does it keep the show alive, it'll give you more of each topic than you're going to find here in the free feed as I'm adding exclusive content regularly. So for both the price of a cup of coffee, subscribe to the premium feed at patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. And with that said, let me thank the newest supporters of the show, Wendy, Kevin, Megan, and my sidekick, Anne-Marie. Thank you for your generous support. And for anyone else who'd like to support the show but can't do it financially, you can give me a big hand by simply sharing the episodes on social media and letting some like-minded friends know what we're doing here. If you have any story ideas, if you want to give me feedback on the show, find me at nighttimepodcast.com slash contact or on social media. I use Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and I'm often live on the Nighttime Podcast YouTube channel. So until next time, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and let me know if you see anything weird. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. Copyright Jordan Bonaparte.